Welcome, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, coming to this uh, free webinar, New Models of Disruption by uh, Ann Oswaldo Lorenzo, um, the CEO of Unichemia. Um, this is the agenda for today. I'd like to introduce uh, our new alliance uh, between uh, Subsi and Unichemia, and, and Ivan Ureta is with me to, to do it. And yeah. then um, then uh, I'm going to introduce the new course we are planning for January and launch for January to 2023. And after that, the presentation uh, by Professor Kawalek about new disruption models and the final part of the webinar for question and answers. Uh, you will, uh, you will um, write some question or comments in the chat box if you want, I, I will be as a moderator. Um, collecting all of them and organizing or classifying them for uh, um, for Dr. Kawalit answering those questions at the end of the session. Okay. Um, well, uh, as mentioned, it's, it's a great it's a great pleasure for me to uh, to stay here with uh, Dr. Ivan Ureta uh, to announce the the new alliance between the University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Southern Switzerland and Unikemia. Uh, to develop online education. Then welcome, Ivan, uh, please, uh, could you tell more about this? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Osvaldo. Thanks a lot for everybody for connecting today from different parts of the world. We are very happy and proud to um, get in touch uh, with you today. And as Osvaldo has said, um, we have uh, developed this alliance uh, between the, our university, the University of Applied Sciences of Southern Switzerland and Unikemia to foster and develop uh, online programs worldwide. Uh, we met uh, already as a faculty at the Usto Business School. We share a lot of um, things in common when it comes to uh, quality online education. Uh, so therefore, along with Unikemia, we have identified the, the, the importance of strengthening this uh, collaboration uh, to bring to, to different publics and audiences uh, cutting edge uh, topics that um, we like to approach um, in an innovative way, also uh, placing at the center of our attention uh, issues uh, linked to um, uh, responsible management, um, ethics, uh, leadership, and different ways of looking or, 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 or exiting this um, the common wisdom that we might, uh, might have challenging uh, new ways of thinking. So that's the, 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 the very reason why we have a strengthening this collaboration, this alliance, uh, which is going to be modular. So we are starting with this um, free webinar in which you are all participating from different parts of the world. And uh, apart from that, we are going to be launching also, as uh, uh, Osvaldo is going to present uh, later on, a, a course a specific course, uh, which is going to be the first brick of a series of courses that are going to be uh, creating a certificate of advanced studies um, <clears throat> on, on issues like uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, disruption, and, and so on and so forth. So we are very uh, yeah, thrilled uh, to launch today this collaboration and to, yeah, looking forward to bring you a new content uh, and, and, and ways of, of, of thinking and and developing uh, things. So thanks a lot, Osvaldo. Again, um, welcome everybody. And I give you the, the floor. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ivan. And as a part of this uh, new alliance, we, as you mentioned, we are uh, launching a new uh, first course, Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Practical Models and a Roadmap for Immediate and Effective Application, which is starting in February 5th, uh, 2023. 100% uh, online course, and we'll be uh, together, Peter, Kawale, Ivan, and myself as a program faculty for this uh, for this course, and which is a, a short course. It's only four weeks, uh, and and involve for include the possibility to to do a project, individual project for a group project for um, uh, for uh, using and applying. The different tools we are going to teach related to entrepreneurship and innovation, the entrepreneurial uh, life cycle, yeah, uh, management, and and this course will be part of, a, as as mentioned by Ivan, will, will be part of a certificate of advanced studies. Uh, we are now preparing that, um, consisting of different uh, 
courses, you can see just a sample of potential itinerary uh, or path uh, for this uh, uh, certificate. Uh, we are going to announce uh, shortly in, 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 in next weeks uh, as part of the um, also a complement of this course of entrepreneurship innovation to, to have a, a, a comprehensive certificate with a set of different topics related to entrepreneurship innovation and sustainability. Okay, um, thank you again. I see uh, more people uh, joining us uh, uh, after the beginning. And it's time for starting the, the presentation, new, <clears throat> new models of disruption. <clears throat> Sorry, and our guest speaker is uh, Peter Cowell. It is, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Peter. He is uh, a PhD professor and director of Center for Information Management at Lockbro University, uh, which is, by the way, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, has been awarded as one of the top three uh, information technology research center in Europe recently, which is a, a great achievement. Congratulations, Peter. And Peter is also visiting professor at Alliance Manchester Business School and Atlantic Technological University. Then I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And, and if you allow Peter to start, um, start sharing his screen, okay? Yes, thank you. Um, correct. So I will just put my screen here. Before you are starting, Peter, just remember people that can uh, write comments or questions in the chat box, and I will be organizing them for final part of question and answer. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, no problem with the with the chat. I look forward to seeing what the comments are. Uh, okay. Great. Okay. Just checking that the volume is okay. I think it is uh, from the reactions. So we will we will start and uh, thank you, uh, Ivan and uh, Oswaldo for the introductions and and uh, to Patricia for the support and all the team and it's great to be part of this um, a very important uh, 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 inaugural session. So when we talk about new models models of disruption, what I will be doing is combining. Um, I will be combining this well-known theory of disruptive innovation with some new research to elaborate how we can see it more differently in this 21st century, in the in the 2022, as, as we are going forward. So um, what I will do is I will um, set out a little bit of context for it. So we see it in the big picture, the amazing times in which we live. <laughs> Um, uh, turbulent times, good times, and so on and so forth in which we live. And then we will go into the kind of the core model and then expand that core model so we see it in a new, in a, in a new light, a more uh, sophisticated light. And as I mentioned, this is using some original research. So we will situate, so Clayton Christensen is the important name, and we will situate him with uh, Joseph uh, Schumpeter out uh, as a bigger framework. And then we will look at these elaborations that we have around the kind of core framework. Uh, this is related to the high end disruption, to the work of Joshua Gans, and then to the original work we have in the fintech and insurtech sectors. So, uh, assuming the slides are changing, okay, Schumpeter. Yes. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Schumpeter is next. And he is uh, uh, kind of giving a story of the economy in his work. He was a um, pr professor at Harvard for many years, and he gave a kind of this story of the economy in powerful language. He says, creative destruction. And he says, creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. What he is saying here is he is saying that um, what we have is a kind of process by which technology replaces itself or is replaced by new technologies and the firms making better investment decisions in new and old technologies allow the economy to move uh, uh, in kind of like in a wave form, creative destruction. One wave is replacing another. For example, new semiconductor technology replaces older semiconductor technology. Robotic production replaces standard machines, and there has been capital investment in standard machines, but then 
capital investment in robotic production shows some efficiency benefits. It, it, it brings in this creative destruction where there is something creative happening, the robotic production, but also the, the um, uh, uh, destruction of the old form. Uh, you know, we, we can kind of account for the whole of economic history in, in capitalism through this Schumpeterian model, uh, such as the how production lines in, have replaced the old craft shop in traditional industry. So creative destruction, the middle point I have here, refers to the incessant product and process innovation mechanism by which new production units replace, um, replace outdated ones. Uh, some little details as we look at this kind of theory is that under this, um, the process of creative destruction is moving us forward as a society. It has um, some elaboration in, in terms of extending markets, extending access to markets. So you can, in a broad way, in a broad, maybe simple way, hypothesize that fast movement through these cycles, business cycles of Joseph Schumpeter is preferable. And um, then some kind of uh, economic points that relate to us now as we come out of COVID as a kind of um, uh, key point is he shows that as the economy slows down, then actually the, the process of renewal also slows down. This is from Caballero and others. But so uh, as the economy goes into a, a slowdown like we have now, actually innovation begins to slow down and studies of Japan are saying this as well. So really what we want to see um, if we want this kind of fast progress is we want to see a healthy economy driving new races, new challenge, new competition between um, existing forms of business and replacement forms of business. So just to recap, this is the big context. Let's take this Schumpeterian view of the economy. We can debate it. Certainly we can debate it, but let's take this Schumpeterian view of the economy. And then we say, this is about technology replacing technology and the preference that if we want this to work really well or to make rapid progress, we should have a healthy economic conditions. It, it, it does not really work so well when there is a recession or downturn. Now, a uh, small quote, and then we move to Clay Christensen. But um, I think this is very interesting. Uh, Schumpeter is saying, a particular business idea requires a specific set of largely sunk investments in physical and human capital. The value of these investments depends on a particular bet regarding the future match between tastes and technology. When the bet goes wrong, or when the conditions that made it successful change, companies often have no choice but to abandon their activities and shut down. And this is Schumpeter speaking in 1942. And he is kind of saying to us that beware, beware, even a great company will fail. You know, a company that has made successful bets, calculations on where they invest their capital and they, where they build their capabilities, a company that has done that successfully for many decades can become unsuccessful when the circumstances change. When the circumstances change, the successful company can become unsuccessful. Great firms can fail. And that line, great firms can fail, is really where we introduce the work of Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen comes in with that line and he says, why? Why? And this is what uh, Christensen uh, begins to, to speak of in his own language from the late 1990s onwards. He begins to talk about the innovator's dilemma, dilemma. What is what, what to do? What is right? If even good firms fail, if they get their technology bet wrong, how do we understand how, how we can survive um, when maybe our decision making itself traps us and hurts us? This innovator's dilemma is in the first contribution of Clayton Christensen. And he did it for his PhD thesis. Anyone who is interested in, in a PhD study might know that, note this, that he had a, 
uh, he built from his PhD thesis an, an, an incredible body of work and an incredible contribution over following 20 uh, or more years. So the innovator's dilemma, how do we get the bet, bet right? And his study was of disk drives. His first study was of disk drives in the computer industry. And he's, he's kind, he was kind of showing this graph, you see the, the um, uh, capacity on the left and um, progressing uh, on, on the horizontal, we see the, um, the, the timeline. But basically what we are seeing is that the different disk drive technologies in computers changed over time, became more, more powerful. And a company that had bet on a first series, let's say 14 inch drives for mainframes, and they had spent money building factories on this for this technology, and they had hired engineers and built capabilities for this factory. They were challenged when some new rival comes from another position. Let's just make this move from A to B, mainframes to mini computers. And a rival is coming with um, mini uh, with eight inch drives, a, a new technology, a new technology base, and um, with new capital investments, what Schumpeter would call a new bet. And this one is rivaling them. And uh, uh, Christensen, he asks himself, why is it so hard to see this? Why, if you are in the computer disk industry, is it so hard to see the new rival coming? He says in the end that what it is, is a combination of technology and business model. And this is what is confusing, is that uh, for the, for the uh, dominant firm, maybe the one that is making the earlier grade of technology, the new technology and business model is confusing to them and they don't understand it. Plus, of course, Schumpeter's key point, they have already invested in this, in this key technology. So this is where he draws what we call planes of competition, P-L-A-N-E-S, like a geometric plane, the planes of competition, like a different geometry. And he says the issue with technology innovation, where technology is combined with new business models, key topic for us in our research, where te technology is combined with new business models, you are kind of not competing on the same terms. You are not making a, a directly superior product. You are offering the consumers a different kind of proposition. This is the, the mention of the, the term planes of competition, different geometric planes, different geometric planes. And as we will see, the new uh, geometric plane, the new plane of competition tends to be bigger and larger than the old one. We can draw it in this way. What we are, what he is really describing is a dynamic in three parts, that we have the existing market. This is shown as the black line in this schema. The existing market is drawn on a gradient upwards. Why? Because it's under market pressure. And the firms in that existing market, which can be anything, by the way, now, this existing market can be anything you want to consider, but it's under pressure, so he draws it on a gradient, like they are racing up the hill. And he says the new challenger is actually the disruptor is the red line. And this is a kind of dynamic he's trying to express. This red line will come to challenge the black line and maybe destroy it. But it's coming from a different position, from a different technology base and a different consumer base. And then something very interesting and a little bit subtle. He says that what happens is that, that the red line, that new technology, it gets better. It receives R&D investment and it gets better. But initially, it might be worse. Initially, it might be inferior, but it's doing something different. And that's the subtlety. The third line, which is the small one on the right hand side, where it talks of level of sophistication required by customers, that third line is saying there are some consumers for whom a smaller disk drive is perfectly fine. For example, in relation to the to the um, disk drive market, or, or or in any relation in relation to any market, there are some consumers for whom an some ways inferior product is perfectly fine if it has 
um, some properties that they can utilize, like it's smaller, more compact, more useful in more circumstances. And what he is saying is the disruption is basically that the red line is going to meet this new uh, market niche, this new market segment, who don't care about all the sophistication of the dominant market, the black line, is going to meet them, grab hold of them, and from there it will get revenue and it will make its Schumpeterian bet on the future and become the rival eventually to the, to the uh, dominant industry uh, uh, notified here as the black line. This is always a war between technology combined with business model. It's not, it's not technology alone. Sometimes we talk of disruptive technology in a way that's incorrect. It's technology plus the business model. And famous cases like um, the kind of uh, uh, business school textbook famous cases such as Kodak uh, or, the, or the fight of Fujifilm against digital images embedded on smartphones, for example. And uh, we, we kind of say, well, actually, the digital image was, was initially much, much inferior to, to a chemical image in terms of pixel quality was much inferior. Um, but was very convenient and was packaged in a new business model. It was bundled into the phone and the digital image began to get better from that point. So a very famous kind of business school staple case like the destruction of Kodak, one of the 20th century's greatest firms with one of the most prominent brands and some of the greatest sponsorship deals and, and uh, most historic uh, associated with the most historic events on the planet, the photographs of every president of the 20th century taken with Kodak, that was destroyed by this new technology coming with a new business model, which was simply initially inferior. It got better later, the digital image, as the pixel count increased, but initially it was inferior. It was just more con uh, convenient. So the code Kodak was ultimately challenged and then destroyed by basic cameras that were bundled onto phones and that revenue stream then made them better. It's the same pattern that we see again and again. We could go back to the disk drive, but it's like the mainframe versus the PC. The PC initially does not have the power of the mainframe, but it gets better and it becomes networked and therefore the mainframe computer and that industry is destroyed by the PC industry. Or we could talk about store-based, DVD-based uh, um, video rental versus something like Blockbuster, another business school <laughs> key case, uh, great case uh, of um, Blockbuster. And, and it's uh, uh, the, the way in which streaming services such as Netflix, uh, they started off with with uh, not so prominent brands, not so many film deals. Um, and indeed, they started off as postal services, but they developed and they got better and they disrupted this market and they became uh, much bigger than Blockbuster ever was. So what this is telling you about is something quite interesting, is that the, the point that I'm emphasizing here is that at least if we take uh, Christensen's work in its pure form, then um, in its pure form, the disruptor is coming in a way from the bottom of the market. It's coming with a, a consumer proposition or a business proposition that has novelty, but is coming from the bottom of the market. You know, initially, uh, Kodak building beautiful films for Hasselblad cameras for uh, uh, etc was not challenged by uh, a small pixelated image on what was probably a Motorola or an early Nokia in those days and they didn't see this threat so the executives let the rival come let the rival come to their to their garden let the rival come to their town and destroy them but but it, the key point here is that that in the classic model of, of Christensen's work, the, the, um, the, the disruptor, the new rival, in a way is coming from the bottom of the market. Now, some debate about that, but if I just take that position and move on, then we can go on to say Dyer and Bryce, and they are saying, yeah, that's great, and that's important, but they elaborate the model. And they elaborate the model by saying, yes, that's really true. And that's been a real key um, 
kind of point that's a real key observation in the history of business over the last 30 40 years but we are also seeing firms do great work from the top of the market and they are changing the dynamics of the market they are changing the planes of com competition from the top and that's a little bit different to uh, Clayton Christensen's original theory. So Dyer and Bryce are saying, hey, have a look for high-end disruption, something we discuss in the forthcoming book um, uh, that, that, that uh, we, we have written. Have a look for high-end disruption as well. The high-end disruptor, disruptor targets the most profitable co customers first. And from this inception point, it begins to move backwards if you like, almost fall backwards and work its way backwards to the um, to uh, uh, the most dis to, to towards the kind of lower ends of the market. So it starts from the most discriminating and, and uh, least pr price sensitive buyers, and then begins to work backwards towards um, building volume and, and building a defensible position in the market by finding uh, customers at a lower price point in the market later. What we heard with classical disruption was something that starts in an inferior position, but then gets better. What we are saying now with this high-end disruption is something starts at the top, but then in a sense builds cheaper forms of itself. And this, according to Dyer and Bryce, uh, covered in the book, is um, typical. Uh, this is typified, for example, by the, the iPhone strategy of Apple. So Apple, in a sense, built at the top of the market, and then in order to defend its position and to maximize its advantage, had to build scale. And it built scale by, by creating versions such as the C versions, C versions, so like the 5C or the SE. So it has the kind of superior version, which is at the top of the market, but then to 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 contest rival space uh, of companies like Samsung, it then builds cheaper versions and kind of works backwards. Different to Clay Christensen's original model, this Dyer and Bryce. Similarly, in the EV market, Tesla arrived at the top with the Model S, but then worked its way back to create the Model 3. And by the time they have the portfolio with the Model 3 and the Model S, now also models X and Y, then what they have then is a defensible portfolio with sufficient economies of scale to stop um, rival firms impersonating their te technology and destroying their market share. So the high-end disruption is an elaboration of the model, and we will just put, take on a few more elaborations and then we are done. So we have Clay Christensen's original model now, and then we have the, the Dyer and Bryce elaboration. And Joshua Gans in his study, a uh, very famous and significant economist, he was saying, well, also consider that there are two kinds of disruption going on. There's the demand side, demand side disruption, when successful firms focus on their main customers and underestimate market entrants that have innovations that target niche, niche demands. That sounds like Clay Christensen. But also the supply side, when there's an issue because the the firms focused on developing existing competencies become incapable of developing new ones. And these are, he's saying, this original dilemma that Clay Christensen uh, introduced, this dilemma of the of the um, of the firm, the innovators' dilemma. We can understand it, uh, demand side and supply side. And a um, little bit overlapping, so not entirely pure, but we can say that the demand side is a Kodak type problem and the supply side is a Blockbuster type problem. Um, the Blockbuster, they built their product ranges. It was a, I don't know if you ever encountered one of these DVD stores, but they built their product ranges. They built their service offer. They had lots of bricks and mortar retail. But all of these things made them incapable in terms of capital investment and uh, recruitment of the, uh, their existing investments, made them incapable of moving to a new position, even though they were offered the chance to buy uh, Netflix. So elaborating the ideas a little bit, and, and then we begin come to our original research, but elaborating those ideas, we can say that um, 
there is a kind of general observation which says that um, part of the problem is not just a kind of cognitive problem. There is a cognitive problem. There is a cognitive problem. There is the problem that many executives, they are, are trained in the market, for example, trained in the market of the film camera, and they just don't understand uh, the new technology with its new properties. But, but then this kind of other layer of difficulty highlighted here in this, um, in this and many other articles, which is saying, yes, but even if they do understand the problem, even if they do, they can't move their company. They can't go to the shareholders and say, hey, um, that factory we built uh, 24 months ago on a depreciation cycle of 60 months, it's already, <laughs> it's already, uh, or 120 months, it's already out of date. They can't, um, given the kind of bet, again, going back to Schumpeter, the bet that they've made and the sunk costs that they've incurred, even if they see it, all they can do is, in a sense, um, uh, watch their company come down and nurse value um, along the way, because the, the 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 capital bets in a competitive market have constrained them. They fix them into a position. So uh, disruption, uh, even when understood, it doesn't mean the firm can react. This opens up um, another area of thinking, which um, is typified by Tushman and O'Reilly and their idea of the ambidextrous firm, which is to exploit and explore. And uh, what um, they are saying is that, therefore, the only response you can have to the in innovator's dilemma is to build a firm that is uh, ambidextrous, I will explain that, but which can both do radical R&D and look after um, uh, existing markets. Most firms, over time, under market pressure, building economies of scale, building economies of scope, and productivity efficiencies of all kinds, most firms under pressure over time tend to focus only on serving existing markets. And they dispense with any idea of doing more radical research and development. And the the, the um, implication implication of Tushman and O'Reilly is to say, please be aware that as you commit yourself to the existing market, you are losing your ambidexterity. And ambidexterity is the ability to, for example, do fine tasks with two hands. It's, I know it's long term. Ambidexterity, ambidextrous, ambidextrous. And it's an it's a it, you know it's a long it's a long word, but it's all it is saying is, for example, somebody who can sign their name right hand and left hand or left hand and right hand is ambidextrous. And he's saying, beware that you are falling into the innovator's trap the more you service your existing market. So there's a whole area that begins to open up in terms of corporate design. And one of the things that we are exploring with Unikimia, Unikimia and, and Subsi uh, is, is this area of corporate design as a new part of the business school curriculum to design the firms that can cope with turbulent changes in the future. So the innovator's dilemma becomes uh, less and less significant. And we'll see a little bit of response in this last few minutes as I talk now. So now, um, I think when we look at it in, from the point of view of 2020, 2019, 2021, 2022, uh, our, our current era, what we are seeing is an, an elaboration of what of the kind of model that Christensen dis described. For example, if we look at the world of fintech, and um, so fintech, I can divide into financial technology, fintech, and decentralized finance, DeFi decentralized finance and these are kind of overlapping but but also distinguishable trends in the industry now and the way these new technology models are competing with uh, traditional banking in institutions finding uh, early adopter positions 
and beginning to develop from those points with increased technology offers, with increased service offers. So if we look at what we are seeing in, in an industry, a, a great and substantial industry like banking, for example, and the rivalry of DeFi and FinTech coming into that market as this kind of disruptor, what we are seeing is much less of a kind of one-for-one -one kind of uh, contest that we that I described in relation, say, to the camera markets and the film markets of kind of Kodak versus um, the you know smartphone cameras. What we are seeing is a much more multiple and and um, complex picture as the new fintech innovations are, are taking what I would call value chain positions, value chain positions. I will finish in a few moments. But so they are not trying to replace the whole of banking, but a cluster, a pack of innovators are taking different value chain positions. And the effect of this pack, let me call it a pack of dogs, is to bring down um, or might be to bring down some of the big institutions and take their place, not one for one, new technology versus an old technology, but basically an old technology versus a pack or a cluster of new technologies. And uh, for example, in the tech uh, NGI um, project, which is next generation insurance project, we saw that that there are value chain uh, innovations such as in risk prediction, artificial intelligence, in behavioral insurance and back office integrations. And these are contesting the insurance industry and these are changing the value chain. So it's not one rival, but a multiple pack, like a pack of dogs taking down uh, their prey. So we call this kind of like pack of dogs versus the gazelle, you know, this uh, gazelle in the plain, uh, in the uh, let's say, uh, African plain and the pack of dogs like hyenas, they are coming as a cluster. And there is not a one-to-one -one rival or even a one-to-two or one-to-three. This is many different value chain innovations that are altering the insurance industry and they are exploiting multiple adopter positions. So it's like Christensen's model now is, is much more uh, complex uh, as it's enacted. And part of the way in which then the insurance industry plays the game is, um, is to itself become an, adopter, an, an adopter of the new technologies. Conscious of Tushman and O'Reilly and the ideas of ambidexterity, conscious of what Clay Christensen said about the dilemma of the innovator, they have moved to become innovators themselves in a way to disrupt themselves but then to at least have a new value chain position in a disrupted in industry in the future. So one of the responses is for the gazelle to adopt some of the radical technology that might help to kill or destroy its, its core base, but allows it to live in a new form in the future. There are multiple profit positions for new entrants, and we can talk again about the insurance industry and. Uh, um, a software as a service risk evaluation examples such as Zigo insurance for gig economy workers playing to a particular niche or cover uh, this term for pay, pay uh, per drive car insurance and, and using sensors and so on and so forth such as parcel uh, which is used in the commercial insurance regime and these these things together constitute constitute a disruption not these things alone and a, and a new and final case, which is in relation to DeFi and FinTech, where we've seen, for example, um, in, in DeFi systems such as identity systems and wallets and payment gate, gateways and peer-to-peer -peer lending, each taking a position and the banking industry being affected by these as a cluster, as a pack, not a singular value chain propositions. So it brings me to the conclusion, which is that in this journey, we have seen that this is the game of, um, of capitalism, according to Schumpeter. This is the essential fact about capitalism. This is the game. This is how it works. And we can also uh, kind of condone uh, Christensen's um, uh, classic insights because they continue to describe the modern economy. But then we can say that in the 21st century, we need more than that. 
And we need to elaborate the model and to see that firms have learned new strategies. They have new, learned new ways of behaving. So we need to elaborate Christensen's um, ideas, for example, through um, uh, Bryson Dyer and the idea of a top end innovation that then falls backwards or, or commissions itself backwards into the lower points in the market building scale and um so this kind of supply side and demand side differentiation of joshua gans and then see at the very cutting edge in real and live research undertaken by um uh, uh, scholars such as ourselves here uh, uh, ivan oswaldo and myself we are seeing that there are there, there are, are, are multiple potentially interoperable uh, disruptors that affect value chains and profit pools in, in the finance and insurance industries. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm very happy to take some questions if there are any. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, you can see um, one question in the chat box, particularly the Roberto Camagna. And asking a question, can you read it? The problem, uh, let me read it. The problem of incumbent uh, is not to see the new technology approaching due to the initial low quality of the new one, then it's too late. Also, because new players are normally smaller and more dynamic. What is your thought on this? The question. Yes. yes, correct. So I think all of that is correct in the classical model of Christensen. So thank you for that. And I think it is smaller and more dynamic, partly because the new capital goes to it. Understanding the theory of Schumpeter, understanding the theory of Christensen, the, 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 the new rival attracts venture capital that is interested in the um, biggest payoff. Whereas, for example, a public firm, uh, maybe a dominant uh, rival is a public firm, uh, with its shareholder capital base is is less able to um to 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 raise funds uh, quickly on what seems like a um, um a bet what seems like an unsure proposition so i think part of the agility is to do with the capital framing of the two of the two rivals but but i agree with everything you say roberto um thank you peter next question from nitsik Rawal, what are the six D, D's of the disruption model? What are the three highly disruptive digital technologies? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so perhaps you uh, elaborate on that uh, on that for me, but I would say uh, right now what we are looking at is disruption amongst, uh, so in the digital domain, you would say uh, you should consider um, AI, of course, artificial intelligence, of course. And secondly, you can uh, also talk about the new blockchain and the blockchain architectures that are being developed, of course. And I think on the third one, you should talk about IoT and sensors. So, um, so uh, is 5G a disruptive technology? In the sense, yes, it is in the sense that it is part of a cluster associated with IoT, it means Internet of Things, Internet of Things. So um, uh, 5G associated with the Internet of Things becomes uh, a disruptor, for example, in agricultural markets. So uh, I would say uh, yes to that nice question. Um, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Another question, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 Nan Prasad, uh, uh, very uh, a beautiful and um, philosophical question. <laughs> so, and we, you know, we could talk an hour for this. So can communication skills and empathy be automated in the near future? So there are robots, you, you might have seen one, it's called uh, AIDA, uh, A -I -N -D -A. Uh, there are latest generations robots like this one, which has a human face, uh, Aida. And um, certainly a human being, I think when you see um, uh, the robot that looks human, you feel your, uh, your biology, your mirror neurons react. Uh, it's like called like this 
uh, mirror neurons. This is how a uh, human being constructs empathy. Your mirror neurons react to the robot and you are asking yourself the question, um, can uh, you know, how, why am I thinking that, that she is feeling pain when she is a machine like this? And why am I calling her she? Because they have made her look uh, uh, female. So I think there's a very interesting and philosophical debate to be had there, but certainly on the human sides, the human beings have some reaction to the robots, which is empathetic. The, the, the robots then themselves might mimic empathetic reactions, you know, and be trained to do so, but they're not using biology. They're not using mirror neurons. So there's a qualitative difference there. And in the science fiction kind of debate, we have to remember there's a qualitative difference between algorithms and ele electronic circuitry uh, and, uh, and something that is based ultimately on um, uh, neuro neurology, endocrinology, the bloodstream, etc. So ultimately, the science fiction question comes to this. Um, uh, interesting philosophy, though. This one, we need, we need to have a big cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. There's another question from Diyasha. Yeah? Any particular thing one should keep in mind when launching a new brand or product in the market? Uh, again, very nice question, uh, Tiyasha. Um, so I think the potential um, for disruption uh, should always be considered in the... Um, in the early stages of developing a venture, uh, can you build a disruptor? Classically, um, you can. You can. Um, uh, the, the biggest wins, the biggest victories in 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 uh, the economy uh, or in the world of entrepreneurships are by the people who successfully launch disruptors. But most entrepreneurship is around innovations, smaller incremental innovations. And so I would say in response to your question, the first thing should be to identify where you are. Are we in the business of disruption or are we in the business of an incremental innovation? And if it is an incremental innovation, your strategy is different. You are entering a, an existing market with some um, minor scale uh, product or service improvement. You might win a lot. You might be very successful but your strategy will be different to the strategy of disruption and your investment cycles will also be shorter. Um, so this is, this is, um, um, this is key. Um, but again, it's happy to debate further. Um, uh, what are the uh, factor which uh, leads to success? Um, So many factors, um, but um, Christensen, for example, is alerting you to some of them. And one of the things that I think uh, perhaps an implication of Christensen that we haven't said enough about yet is that it, uh, the disruptor will typically build much bigger markets than the incumbent. So typically with a low end disruption of Christensen's classical model, one of the things to look out for is, can we build a much bigger market, a much bigger user base than our rivals already in the industry? That's one of the things to look out for, but many, many others. And again, thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. Roberto, another excellent point from you. Thank you so much. I believe that the disruptive tech are the results of convergence between previous disruptive technologies. For example, AI blockchain are allowed by the evolution of cal calculation capabilities and the low cost for them, thus to allow implementation of algorithms in an effective, uh, in an effective way. So, um, yes, I think that's a very good point because that, that is why the digital industries themselves, in other words, those firms with the highest capability in relation to to software and its associated hardware uh, have taken such advanced positions in the market because in a sense they have formed a stream of innovations out of their core capability of the software hardware com combination. Uh, 
So I think Roberto, I think that's a that's a nice and useful insight, and that is explaining why a firm like Apple or Alphabet or Alibaba in 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 China, while while these firms are taking multiple positions across multiple traditional industries. So um, that that is a is a good point because they are developing their core technology, their core capabilities. So. Uh, uh, Ch Chata, uh, in relation to your nice question, thank you. Yes, uh, I would say so, yes, but in the 21st century, we need to have a more elaborate view of Christensen's work. We need a more uh, nuanced view of Schumpeter's work, and uh, th this will help us to guide in innovations as they develop in the future. We, we cannot just rely on the, um, uh, on the old models in their simpler form, although that they are, they are still important um right the, the, just, uh, okay thank you peter i got a, a question related to the because when you present in the pack of dots is uh, it looks like this new model of disruption is uh, in some somehow is favorable for incumbents i mean the incumbents can uh adapt quicker than than in other cases, in order to, to working together with with some uh, some players in this new kind of clusters, is is this is this thought correct? What do you think about this? I think that thought is correct uh, as well. Though I th that we have seen it in the insurance industry, for example, mm. also in the banking industry, that um, th uh, through combination of strategies, including research and development, A, uh, including B, corporate venturing, and uh, uh, C, uh, acquisitions, that um, through these multiple strategies, the modern firm is trying very hard not to be disrupted and also to participate in future markets that are disrupted. So again, this is a new chapter this is a new chapter that you are pointing to in the in the business textbook, where the modern firms they get their revenge, you know, and they participate mm -hmm. yeah. in the disruption. In the new chapter, they get revenge, they participate, and they help. Um, you know, they help to disrupt themselves, but at least they have some life in the new market, and they don't have the story of Kodak. So that's a very good question, uh, Oswaldo. Uh, uh, Ute. Uh, the, uh, Utebog, uh, do and if so, how do the sequences cycles of new business models change? Here, insurance, blockchain, and AI to support the risk management and maybe combined with new f financing models. Well, quite an involved question, that one, but I think risk management is a good thing, good point to, um, to highlight here. And, and I, th I think where your your kind of intuition would go would be towards a kind uh, seeing that um, um, proven players, um, I think there's a kind of a hypothesis in what you're saying, proven players that have proven technology, therefore reduced risks, um, can then uh, move quickly to more um, uh, uh, more related positions in a, in a market undergoing disruption. So in other words, um, as part of this pack of dogs, it's it's possible to be more than one dog, if I put it like that, if you see what I mean. It's possible to be more than one dog, but to have multiple supply chain positions as a firm, and then you have a superior risk management profile, because for example, your, your expertise in blockchain is, is deployed more than once. Um, so something like this as a kind of speculative uh, uh, answer. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Joshi, yes, you are right. <laughs> uh, well done, Joshi, <laughs> you are right. Uh, that's, a, that's a disruptor for sure. And the new, new web architectures, I think, are showing that. Um, uh, Robert, um, Good point, good, perhaps the last one, but Roberto, good point. So Roberto was asking if regulators can can jeopardize disruptors. That's certainly possible. And I think 
one reason why we are still seeing the United States have um, more sec success with with technology uh, disruptors. We're still seeing this because um, um, I think the relatively deregulated markets are, um, and also advanced venture capital communities are, are allowing more experimentation amongst entrepreneurs. And uh, Euro Europe is still slower, I think, say, uh, say on the issue of DeFi. There's far more exciting stuff come from the United States. So regulation is a key issue. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's, I think we, we are ready for uh, finishing this session. And, and thank you, everyone, for uh, your participation, question, and fantastic questions, and uh, very thoughtful. Yeah. And I, we, to finish, I, I want to invite you to uh, uh, follow our next uh, webinar that is uh, soon will be uh, released, the information about the next webinar uh, with Peter as well. And, and also to, to know more about the new alliance between Subsea and Unikemia and uh, our new set of courses for uh, 2023, okay? Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you, Peter. And we keep in touch for next seminar. Uh, thank you, everyone. My pleasure and my privilege to talk to you. Thank you as well, Dr. Patricia, Ivan. Thank you.